Good afternoon. Up here in the corner, it feels a little bit like in the church. But I always wanted to be a pastor, so this is my moment, even if it's only for a few minutes. My name is Alberto Godenzi. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Work at Boston College. And I'm really delighted to be here today. And you had a chance to come. There was no snowstorm. Sun is out there. Things are all looking good. Your presence probably underlines that one of the most important issues to our country is healthcare. And with a rapidly aging population and ever increasing costs for healthcare services, the US healthcare system is at the crossroads. Some people say it is broken. The fact remains that our healthcare system is among the most expensive, if not the most expensive, among high income countries, but at the same time, it's not the most effective. The Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, signed into law by President Obama in 2010, represents the most significant change of the regulatory US healthcare system since the passage of Medicare and Medicaid in the mid 60s. So whether or not you think that the Affordable Care Act delivers on its many promises, especially in terms of providing health care to the uninsured, it is legislation that is of utmost importance to social work education, practice, research, and policy. And I'm therefore delighted that our school of social work takes a leadership role in the local and national conversation about healthcare reform. We need to be at the table when issues of quality, access, and cost control are discussed. We need to demonstrate that social workers play a crucial role in the design, implementation, and evaluation of healthcare reform. Fortunately, we have exceptional thought leaders on our faculty. One of them, Melu Sutters, the convener of today's event, served for seven years as commissioner for mental health for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In 2003, she became president and CEO of the Massachusetts Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children. In 2012, she was appointed to the Massachusetts Health Commission Board, which has been monitoring the reform of Massachusetts health care delivery in an effort to reduce costs and improve quality. I had the privilege to be at a number of events on healthcare reform with Mary Lou, with a pioneering vision for an integrated health approach and the eminent role of social workers. In this undertaking, she's leading the charge. Today's event is another testimony for Mary Lou's leadership. We have an absolutely exceptional keynote speaker in Charles Day Baker Jr. and Mary Lou will introduce the keynote speaker in a second. And then we have an all social workers panel moderated by our own Angela McLean, president of the National Association of Social Workers. Professor Sutters joined the GSSW in 2012 as health, as chair of our health and mental health concentration. And I will always be thankful to our little competitor to BU as Malu earned her MSW at BU School of Social Work because it made my task of attracting her a lot easier as I did not have to explain to her the Boston winters or the, so or the sports mania of this town. Let me welcome Malu Sutters. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, well, the dean did not have to um, uh, talk about New England winters nor um, the mania that is sports in Boston. I'm still trying to figure out what the cross is between a Boston Terrier and a Boston Eagle, and I've come up with flying dog. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Um, I'm grateful to the dean for um, 
allowing us to organize this conversation on health care reform. Uh, we have terrific speakers today. We have a panel this afternoon of what I'm calling a boots on the ground social work integrating health, behavioral health care in action. Um, as everyone knows, both Massachusetts uh, General Law Chapter 58, which is Romney Care, and the Affordable Care Act, which is Obamacare, are significant game changers in our collective interest in eliminating one of our country's long standing inequities, which is health care coverage. It is a social justice issue for all of us. As social workers, regardless of one's field of practice, whether it is in the policy arena or in direct care, or everything in between, we know that coverage does not necessarily translate into accessing, accessing needed medical and behavioral health care. But the laws do eliminate a significant barrier around coverage. At least for half of the states across the country that will expand coverage, Massachusetts has been a leader in this area. The Affordable Care Act's ultimate success, however, will be dependent upon improving quality and patient experience, controlling costs, and coordinating care. And with that comes our role as social workers. Social workers, actually all of us, must also care about health care costs. Given how much it eats up and continues to eat up local, state, and federal budgets, there will not be the essential social supports that we know that individuals with the most chronically disabling conditions need. There won't be health promotion and prevention activities and the other services that are important to our well-being. Our panelists are social workers with boots on the ground, engaged in efforts to make these laws a reality. They are committed to ensuring that children, adults, and elders receive the highest quality care and treatment. But before we hear from our panelists, it is my distinct privilege to introduce the forum's keynote speaker, Charlie Baker. You have his official bio in your program. So let me tell you a little bit more about Charlie, or the Charlie I know. Charlie's a lifelong resident of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the product of a truly bipartisan family. His mother is a Democrat and his father Republican. You can imagine what those conversations were like. Charlie is the Republican candidate for governor of Massachusetts. He cares so deeply about the Commonwealth and its future. His proven track record in healthcare in both the public and private sectors and deep knowledge of state government and business makes him a formidable candidate. One of his most admirable traits, aside from tolerating me in his administration, is his willingness to listen to the many perspectives, and I mean that, truly he will listen to anyone around their perspectives that makes up the best that we know is the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Please welcome in joining my good friend, Charlie Baker, to Boston College. So, First of all, thank you all for being here. Um, when Mary Lou asked me to come speak to you today, I wasn't a candidate for much of anything. And uh, she and I just had a conversation about uh, the Affordable Care Act and what was coming and what that meant and all the rest. And she said, you know, it'd be really nice. We're going to put this forum together. If you could come chat a little bit about this at sort of 30,000 feet, because we're going to have a panel that's going to talk about this uh, sort of at the ground level. And, um, and I, I said I thought that would be a great idea and I'd be happy to do it and I would do pretty much anything for Mary Lou. Um, so for those who are looking for some sort of political stump speech, you will be sadly disappointed because that's not what I'm planning to do today. I'm going to talk a little bit about how I think uh, the Affordable Care Act is going to relate to and affect social work and social workers and in particular those who are in what I call sort of the care management uh, and therapy business. There are a lot of folks in the social worker world who spend a lot of time in advocacy. I'm going to spend a little less time on that. Um, I'm really going to focus most of my remarks on, on the folks who are involved in, in direct care or, or are indirectly involved in direct care, because I think for all intents and purposes, that's where a bunch of the action here is going to be going forward. Um, the one other thing I'll say, just for uh, sort of truth and advertising purposes, when I was at Harvard Pilgrim, I used to write a blog, and I wrote about sort of all kinds of stuff associated with healthcare. Um, but one of the things I wrote in my blog in 2009, around the time the healthcare debate started, was that um, I had enough issues and problems with the way the current healthcare system worked that I would be happy with almost any reform that came out of Washington. Um, I was kind of surprised when Washington couldn't even live up, from my point of view, to that low bar. But that's a story for another day. Um, 
the way I'm going to frame my remarks, when I think about social workers, all right, and I think about social work, I think about problem solving. Most of the time, the people that I dealt with when I worked in state government and the people I dealt with when I was at Harvard Vanguard and the people I dealt with when I was at Harvard Pilgrim who were in the social work world were problem solvers. And a lot of the time what they were doing was trying to stitch clinical issues together with social service issues together with real life issues. And one of the big problems um, the healthcare system has always had, especially when dealing with folks who are managing multiple comorbidities and, and significant mental and physical ailments and issues, is the complexity of trying to put together a treatment regimen that works for somebody whose problems don't fall neatly into any one category or another. And in many cases, uh, it's social work and social workers who deliver a big part of the stitching that puts all that stuff in place. And so that's the lens through which I'm going to talk a little bit about the relationship between the Affordable Care Act and, um, and social work. The ACA, Obamacare, whatever you want to call it, has um, about a million moving parts, okay? And people will be trying to figure out what those moving parts mean for a long time. In fact, I was talking to Mary Lou earlier about this, and she referred to the, to the federal legislation as a blueprint. And I said, actually, I think it's more like um, a napkin on which somebody has drawn a sort of an outline, but the blueprint is very much going to get filled in through regulatory policy, ongoing discussions between state governments and the federal government, discussions between and among the federal government and itself, um, and the practical reality of how it actually gets executed on and implemented over the course of, I think, the next four or five years. Um, and, there, and as we've been watching, as this has been playing out, the White House has uh, has basically gone through the process of significantly altering um, some of the statutory provisions of the original law simply by changing the dates on which they're going to choose to enforce certain parts of it. And I think that's just part of what's going to continue to happen given the enormity of the law and the complexity of a lot of the language in it as it works its way through. But that said, there are sort of three big pieces to the federal law. And I'm going to focus on those three big pieces today. And to anybody who's paid any attention to the whole discussion, and I would expect most people in this room probably have, um, the three big pieces are not going to be surprising. One is a big coverage expansion, which varies a lot depending upon which state you live in and where the state you live in actually was before the federal law got passed. The second is the creation of health exchanges, um, which are sort of jointly operated between the state and the federal government, depending upon which state you're in, and then the cuts in the, in the Medicare program, which I'll talk more about in a few minutes. Now, those come at the same time, there are an enormous number of additional federal initiatives that are playing out as well that shouldn't get lost as part of this conversation and will matter especially to a lot of the folks in this room uh, who are going to be dealing with some of the implications of all of the above. Um, there's a lot of federal leg legislation that's designed to move Medicare and a number of other folks in the provider space into accountable care organization models. Uh, shared risk relationships of one type or another. That will have implications for folk in the, folks in the social work community. Um, all of the federal language and legislation that was part of the stimulus that was tied to meaningful use, um, which is the code word for um, the implementation of electronic medical records. There's meaningful use one, meaningful use two, meaningful use three. Um, all of those, excuse me, federal initiatives, all of which have um, money and oomph attached to them, have been having and will continue to have an impact on the way provider organizations think about the way they structure and deal with all their issues associated with medical records, the movement of information, the privacy of healthcare information, and what it means for people who are trying to engage in um, sort of the ongoing care management of people who have um, multiple conditions and are being treated and seen in multiple locations. Um, the final one is ICD-10, which I'm trying to remember now. ICD-10, everybody here knows what ICD-10 is, right? No, okay. 
ICD-9 is the diagnostic book that people bill for services on in the current world in which we live in, in healthcare. Um, it's sort of the uh, companion piece to the CPT code book, right? CPT code de determines what the procedure is you're actually engaging in. ICD-9 is the diagnostic on which you're pursuing the procedure. The two of them put together translate into the way the administrative system determines what you actually did and why you did it and what you should get paid for it. Um, I can't put it any more simply than that. Um, but long story short, ICD-10 has been on the books and ready to be implemented for, I'm going to say somewhere between five and eight years. Um, and every time it came close to being implemented, the feds would push it off. ICD-10 is a tenfold expansion of ICD-9. And what I mean by that is when ICD-10 fully takes effect, there will be 10 times as many diagnostic codes for people to determine the level of service they're providing and how they choose to bill for it as there are today. 10 times. It is uh, a very significant initiative and it has all kinds of consequences for pretty much everybody who's in the healthcare business and part of the reason it kept getting put off is it's not going to be easy for people to implement on the provider side or on the or on the payer side but all systems are basically go and I think it's expected that by the end of this year people are going to be complying with ICD-10 on a go forward basis and it will be a big deal for most provider organizations and the only reason I bring these other things up is to point out to you that they are all going to be coming at the same time that people are going to be rolling out rules and regulations and, and policies associated with those millions of component pieces I talked about that are associated with the Affordable Care Act. So my, my major message in this is that um, if some of the folks who are in the administrative side of healthcare that you're working with seem to be particularly harried over the course of the next couple of years, um, believe me, they ought to be, because this is all going to be, for many of them, um, a significant period in which they're going to be expected to absorb a lot of changes in the way the system operates, the way the system keeps track of information, the way the system keeps track of, of data, not just clinical data, but administrative data, the processes that they use to manage and collect data and information, and the way they get paid. And you add that all up, and it's going to create um, a little bit of anxiety uh, for a lot of the folks who work on the administrative side. Um, and it's just something, if you're working on the social work side, I can't imagine it won't touch you one way or the other. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the coverage expansion, since that seems to be the part that uh, people are, are most interested in and paying the most attention to. There are three big issues for folks, I think, in the social work space associated with the coverage expansion. The first is it will change for many folks who deal with uh, behavioral health issues and social work issues in the public sector. It's going to change to some extent um, who pays for your services and how you get paid for those services and how organizations relate to that. So for many services that are currently paid for for people who don't have coverage. Um, and, and by the way, a lot of what I'm going to talk about on the coverage expansion has much bigger implications for states other than Massachusetts. Okay? I mean, Massachusetts is it's just going to be different for a whole bunch of reasons, but the biggest one is because most people in Massachusetts are already covered, so the, 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 the changing nature of how this works here is going to be different than it's going to be elsewhere. In other places, the payer is going to change. I mean, the fundamental payer is going to change from being a local government or a county government or a philanthropic institution or a state government to being um, a combination, in most cases, of the state government and the federal government through the Medicaid program. The other thing that will change there, in some cases, is who actually delivers the service. You are going to have situations where, in a number of states, services have been provided and paid for by public entities at the local and county and state level who are going to either become part of a larger care delivery model that's going to involve private people, private nonprofits in some cases, private for-profits and others, who are going to get into the business of delivering care alongside them. Because a lot of these people who historically haven't been covered 
haven't had insurance are now going to have coverage and their coverage is going to apply to the services that are being rendered by these folks currently who are basically covering people or providing services to people who don't have coverage. Um, that will be a modest disruption in the grand scheme of things and I think in Massachusetts much less significant than it will be elsewhere. But nonetheless, it will change the dynamic to some extent. The other thing that's going to happen, and again, this is going to apply more outside Massachusetts than in, because of the limitations in support for primary care that have taken place over the course of you know, the past 15, 15 or 20 years, a whole bunch of people are now going to be eligible for coverage. They're going to get coverage, and they're, excuse me, going to be seeking services. And in many cases, they're going to discover that their ability to access services are going to be limited by the limitations we have within primary care currently, which is going to create um, a secondary dynamic in which I think a lot of other sorts of care providers, in this case PAs, NPs, and probably in some cases um, social workers as well, are going to again end up getting involved in care delivery relationships around primary care practices that simply don't have the capacity or the ability to serve the populations that are going to become part of the covered population that they're going to be looking to serve. I also think we're going to end up discovering that the whole idea of team-based approaches to this population is going to undergo kind of a significant rethinking. And um, I'm a big believer in team-based approaches to health care. But one of the things that somebody, one of the stories somebody read to me one time when I was talking to them about this went something like this. It's a story about four people. Everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was asked to do it. Everybody was sure somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when actually nobody asked anybody. <laughs> and this, I think, is going to be one of the big challenges that you're going to face as people talk about moving to a team-based approach to care because of some of the limitations we have within the current system around primary care and behavioral care and cognitive services generally, which I would argue is because many of them have been sort of left behind by the healthcare system. And you're going to have a whole bunch of people coming into the system, many of whom are going to be looking to access services. And this, this challenge is going to become a very big deal. And, um, I'm a huge believer in team-based approaches to care, but I'm also a huge believer in sort of organizing and defining exactly what it is people are supposed to be responsible for and what they're supposed to be doing. And I think one of the great challenges healthcare is going to face is figuring out within the confines of what people are actually licensed to do, what people are actually going to be reimbursed to do, and what the rules of the game, depending upon who the payer are, are going to require them to do to play to whatever their particular level of participation is in a team-based approach to care delivery. And that's easy to say. It's much harder to do, and I think it will be harder to do as new populations become covered and come into the program. Um, the other thing I would say, so, so my big message to you on that one is make sure, if you're involved in a team-based approach to care, that you and whomever it is you're working with as part of a team-based approach to care defines in very specific terms what it is each player who owns some piece of that care responsibility is actually supposed to do and is expected to do. And make sure whatever way it is you choose to measure who's doing what is understood by people in advance and that you have some way of making sure that you don't end up in a situation where people are going like this and saying, I thought that was your responsibility. I thought that was yours. I didn't know that. That was mine. Um, because one of the great things about healthcare is it totally buys into the notion that it's me and my patient, okay? 
And I admire that, I respect it, and I've been in healthcare for most of my career, and I get it. But in team-based approaches to care delivery, you've got to be willing to think a little differently about that and to recognize that everybody can't belong to everybody and that there has to be some defined set of roles and responsibilities here, and everybody's basically got to agree on it. And one of the things that happens a lot in team-based approaches to care, and I've seen this happen myself, there are superhuman performers who rescue situations and circumstances that haven't been well-defined and well-organized. And that's great, and we applaud them when they do it. But more than anything, under these roles and these responsibilities under this new law, and given all the other changes that are going to be happening administratively at the same time, there aren't enough superhumans out there to solve a lot of these problems. And people are going to need to have structured, and I know social workers don't like that word, but there's going to have to be structured and organized and tracked approaches to what it is each person owns and how it's going to work as part of that team. I mean, when my kids were little, they played football, and actually they still do. Um, sorry. And uh, one of the things they learned from playing football was everybody has a role to play. Their role is defined, and if they do what they're supposed to do, good things happen. If they don't, bad things happen. <coughs> I have a cold. I apologize. Um, I figured if I said I had a cold and didn't show up, that would be a problem. So I'm just going to fight my way through it. But I'll try not to shake your hands and breathe on you when I'm done. Um, and I don't think, generally speaking, and this is a business school guy, and I apologize in advance because I'm, I'm a little bit, um, I lean this way anyway. I don't think medical schools have historically done a very good job of thinking about team-based approaches to care as part of their curriculum. And, um, and I think the caregiving world, as a general rule, is going to have to learn this as they go, because I don't think it's part of a lot of people's fundamental training. And it's going to be something I think is really important for you all, especially as you spend time working with each other and working with other clinical providers to provide the kind of stitching, especially within the primary care and behavioral health space, that's going to be required. Big opportunity, more people covered, different way of thinking about things, um, different sensibility about the role and, and relationship between behavioral health and primary care than we've ever had before. But that's at like 90,000 feet. At 30,000 feet, I don't think it's really been figured out yet. And on the ground, I think we have a long way to go. And uh, I think that creates a tremendous opportunity for all of you, but also at the same time, um, a bit of an opener um, for problems. And I just want you all to think about that real hard as you go forward. Um, now, with respect to part two, which is the creation of these health exchanges, um, you know, the long story short on that is um, Massachusetts has had a horrible time getting its exchange up off the ground, and, and that's been very well covered, and I've had my own comments um, in the public domain about that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Um, other states, in some cases, have done better. The feds have had a terrible time with theirs. For your purposes, as you think about what this all means, um, I would say the following. I think the, if you sort of run this one out a little, while, a little ways down um, over time, I think what it means is you're going to have a lot of people who are, um, we're going to have far more people who, who get their coverage individually than we've had before. I mean, for the most part, about half the insured population in the U.S. has been covered through an employer. About half the insured population has been covered through either Medicare or Medicaid or bought coverage on their own as individuals. I think what's likely to happen over the course of time is you're likely to see fewer people covered through their employers and more people covered as individuals. And one of the things I believe will happen as a result of that, and believe me, I'm getting somewhere that will eventually matter to you, um, one of the things that will happen as a result of that is you're going to have a lot more people buying coverage uh, individually and probably buying coverage that's tied to a particular network. Okay? Historically, when employers bought coverage, they generally speaking wanted everybody to be in the network because it's very hard if you're an employer to tell Frank or Sally that they can't access their hospital or their physician when everybody else can. So employers, when they bought coverage, basically said, we'd like to have everybody in the network. The same was true for Medicare. The same was true for Medicaid. I think one of the things that's going to happen over the course of time uh, is people will buy coverage 
in much more narrow products when they buy it individually for a bunch of reasons. They'll find out that their person is in the network so it works for them. They don't really care if it's any broader or any bigger than that. And the second is, because of some of the cost sharing and some of those plans, people will be encouraged to select a narrow network product because it will be cheaper out of pocket for them and the premium will be cheaper as well. Narrow network products means, at least in the early term, um, more confusion for people about which coverage they have and which network they can access and which providers they can go to. And I think for folks who are in the social work space on the provider side and folks who are working for carriers, you're going to end up spending time helping people understand and navigate uh, the coverage that they have. Um, you know, I remember when Harvard Pilgrim put the first deductible uh, health, uh, health plan out there um, back in the 90s, or no, when was this? 2001. And uh, I knew what a deductible was because I had one on my auto insurance and so did most other people and I just assumed that everybody knew what a deductible was. What I learned was that Everybody kind of knew what a deductible was on auto insurance. No one had any idea what it was in health insurance. And, um, and we discovered as we started selling these products that the phone started ringing off the hook at, uh, in our customer service office with people saying, what's a deductible? And we would explain to them what it was and they would say, no one told me that. And the reaction wasn't so much, I hate it, as it was, I didn't know about it and I wish I had. So one of the things we started doing was literally calling everyone who bought a deductible plan and working with the employers that were interested in selling these and saying, we really want to come to your open enrollment, we want to talk to people, we want to make sure they understand what this is all about because we really want them to know what it is they're getting here, how it works and all the rest. And, uh, and that was the first time I really got involved at Harvard Pilgrim in heavy duty outbound communication with people who are thinking about enrolling in our plans and, and, and taking our coverage. And I think as people buy coverage individually, and as more people are covered individually, and as these networks get a little more defined, and as those networks get a little more defined around the cost sharing, for social workers who are working for providers and for social workers who are working in the, in the plan space, you are going to end up spending time helping people try to figure out what it is they have, where it is they should go, and what kind of coverage they can access. And, um, and, and having worked a lot with social workers over the years myself, one of the reasons I think you will end up doing a lot of this is you're more understandable than most of the other people who participate in healthcare. And that's no offense meant to docs and everybody else, but as a general rule, social workers are really good at putting into a language a regular person can understand what their choices and their options are and where it is they can go and how it is it can work. And I think this is gonna be true coming into the hospital on the front end, coming out of the hospital on the back end, helping them figure out what to do with rehab and follow-up care if they're being discharged because they had a hip replaced and there are only four places they can go, which one should they go to, how do they figure out if it's high quality. It's just going to be a lot of work for, for you folks and I think it's stuff you'll be really good at, but there's going to be more of it than there has been in the past and I'm not sure either the folks on the carrier side or the folks on the provider side understand what's going to be coming on this if you get two or three years down the road. So. Tell them in advance, tell them you heard it from me, hopefully they'll believe you, and act accordingly. Um, now with respect, that was like sort of a joke. I was hoping to get a little bit of a chuckle out of you. Um, number three, the Medicare cuts. Um, they're big. And they cut pretty broadly across everybody on the healthcare delivery side. And in Massachusetts, they cut in a particularly bad way. Um, the argument that was made in Washington when health care reform passed was because the federal government in conjunction with the ACA and health care reform and all the rest was going to cover so many more people, hospitals, physicians, and other providers would have a lot less uncompensated care and because they would have a lot less uncompensated care they could eat these pretty significant cuts in Medicare reimbursement. Well, Massachusetts was already covering 97, 98% of its population. Um, so there is no upside to us associated with more people being covered. People will be covered differently, but the idea that more people are going to be covered, not so much. So what's going to happen here is there's no offset against the Medicare cuts. Our provider community is just going to have to eat the Medicare cuts with no offset improvement and reimbursement anywhere. And I think that's going to create a lot of destabilizing issues for a lot of folks on the provider side over the course of the next 
I mean, those cuts go for 10 years. Um, and it's one of the things I worry the most about with respect to what the impact of the federal reform law is going to be here in Massachusetts. Um, we don't get the benefit of coverage expansion. We don't get the benefit of reduced uncompensated care. What we get are the cuts. And that's it on our end. And I think that's going to create issues um, for everybody on the provider side. And I don't have a good answer for, for how to deal with that other one, other than that's just a fact of life. But it does play out in a different way through what I consider to be kind of the three big mega trends that are going on in the system generally. The first is demographics. Um, no one in this room will be surprised to hear that 10,000 people are turning 65 every day for the next 17 years, and 10,000 people have been turning 65 every day for the past three years, nationally, not just in Massachusetts. The baby boomers are going to be aging into the Medicare program. We all know this is coming, and it's just part of the drill. But it does mean that as that population ages into the Medicare program, and as those Medicare cuts continue to take place, what's going to happen to a lot of folks on the provider side is somebody who was privately covered, for which they were getting paid a privately reimbursed rate, are now going to be covered by Medicare, for which they're going to be getting paid a Medicare reimbursed rate, which is less, and in some cases, a lot less. And it's just something that's going to put additional pressure on the provider community to sort of figure out how to deal with that. And when you're talking about a payer who's going to represent 30, 35, 40 percent, 50 percent in some cases of a provider organization's revenue, it's a really big deal. Um, the second is a uh, big trend is the digitization of healthcare information. Um, I have enough friends in the social work world to know that. That's not exactly what a lot of my friends in the social work community consider to be the most important thing that goes on in healthcare. Um, but at this point, we're sort of past the point of no return, and we're going to have a far more electronic medical record system than we've ever had before. And people are going to start taking that data, and they're going to incorporate it into informatics, which is then going to turn into care delivery patterns and performance patterns, and it's going to start to become part of a larger conversation about what works in healthcare and what doesn't work. And, and the big issue for folks on the ground in healthcare delivery is going to be the changing nature of how people look at information and how they think about it as a tool to improve care delivery. I personally think it's one of the ways to deal with some of the issues associated with the Medicare cuts and the demographic trends and all the rest. But it will also become something that's at times going to feel pretty uncomfortable, I think, to a lot of the folks in the healthcare community, the same way a lot of the evaluative activities in education have felt sort of uncomfortable to a lot of folks in the front lines in education. And the only thing I can tell you about this is um, there's so much momentum around using data and information to understand in a more serious way what's really going on with healthcare and what's working and what's not, that it is going to be part of your future. Um, I personally think in the long run it will be a good thing, but I think it's going to be a bumpy, choppy ride along the way. And then the third big trend is consolidation. And, uh, and what I mean by that is you have a lot of smaller organizations looking for some place to hide. Um, it's mostly defensive. It's not offensive. It's people looking for places to get in and out of the rain. I mean, you go through all those federal initiatives I described at the start of my speech, and if you're a small or a mid-sized player in the healthcare space and you're looking at what the requirements are going to be with respect to compliance and oversight and all the rest, one of the things that looks really appetizing to you is becoming part of a bigger organization where you just worry about what you want to worry about, which is delivering the best care you possibly can to the populations you want to serve, and let some big rig worry about all those issues associated with compliance, regulatory, oversight, and all the rest. Um, now let me just give you one quick alternative view on some of the stuff I just said, and then sort of four final thoughts. I don't actually think the healthcare system is one big system any more than I think the population that's served by the healthcare system is all the same. I actually think there are two populations for the most part in healthcare. 
There's the 95% of people that are, for the most part, reasonably healthy, who have an occasional experience with the healthcare system. They break their hip, they have their tonsils out, they have their appendix removed, they have a child, whatever it happens to be. That 95% of the population spends 50% of the money we spend on healthcare. 5% of the population spends the other 50%. 95 people, 50% of the money, 5% of the population, the other 50%. They are not the same. But the healthcare system, the finance system, the policy making environment, all thinks they're the same. So when we talk about what we're gonna do on a reform basis, we always talk about how we're gonna reform the whole thing, here, there, and everywhere. My wish, would be that one of the things that comes out of this reform that hasn't been written yet, and I don't know if it will ever happen, is that we realize that 95% of the population, the transactional model that we currently have kind of works okay for them, and the 5% that's really sick, it's managing three, four, five comorbidities as physical issues, behavioral issues, psychological issues, who pinball all over the system because the system isn't organized to think about the proactive and aggressive way you would want to treat them, gets factored into a larger conversation about what makes the most sense to do to serve that population. Because the route we're going down now is it's one big reform for everybody because everybody's kind of the same, when the truth of the matter is we're not. And unfortunately, what I see so far is a system that's moving down the road with a whole set of assumptions that presume everybody, for the most part, is more or less the same on the consumer side, on the patient side, when in fact I see two very distinct populations there that if you were to design a system for, you would design a completely different system for the 5% that's really sick than you would for the 95% that's not that sick and every once in a while comes in contact with the system. And my worry, so, my hope is that as this whole reform thing unfolds and as people actually draw the blueprint that goes after the napkin, they'll start to think about a system that's organized and structured that way and financed that way. But I worry that instead we're going to go big system reform and at the end of it we're still not going to realize that that 5% needs a very different approach to care delivery than the 95% who basically can live within the, the framework and the bounds of what we currently do. And then, which then leads me to sort of my four final points, and then I'll stop. And these are just four things for you guys to think about as you embark on your careers. The first, it's literally, it's just like, if my daughter, who's 17, decided to get into this field, these are the four things I would say to her. Um, or my son, okay? First, keep an open mind, okay? I know that's a pain in the neck, but keep an open mind about all of the stuff that's going on around you. Um, Carol, who's sitting right here, Carol Kress, she runs, or she's part of an organization called the Mass Behavioral Health Partnership. I put that in place in uh, 1991. And it was a war between me and everybody else. And I thought it was the only way to do two things. Number one, to create a rational approach to purchasing mental health services for people who are being served by the Commonwealth through the Medicaid program. And I also believe it was the only way we would ever come up with a joint solution between Medicaid and DMH over how to purchase services jointly and collaboratively for people with mental illness. And it worked. And I don't think you could get it out of there now with dynamite. But boy, there are a lot of people in the healthcare world who thought I was insane when I originally proposed this thing. Um, and I might have been, I don't know. But the bottom line was, it was a new idea, it was a different way of thinking about things, and I think most people believe it's been a far better solution than the ones we had in place prior to its arrival. So that's number one, keep an open mind. Not every new idea that comes from some guy in a suit is a bad idea. Um, number two, find a couple of physicians who you can really talk to about what's going on out there. I mean, my, I'm not a doc, okay? 
I don't even play one on TV. I've never pretended to be one. But I have a bunch of friends who are physicians who won't give me the standard line about what's going on in medicine. They will actually talk to me honestly about what's happening out there and their insights and their ability to provide me with support and guidance that's unvarnished and true based on their own experiences in the field and as my friend has been incredibly powerful to me as I've gone through the process of trying to understand in the various points of my career what was really happening out there. And I think one of the things that happens a lot in healthcare is people get into groupthink and they only talk to the group that they hang out with. And the problem with that is all the people you hang out with see the, see the elephant the same way you do. And you really need to find some people who don't see the elephant the same way you do because it's a big, big system out there. And you need to be able to find some people who can truly tell you from the heart and from the head what it is they feel about how it's working and how it's going out there to inform your ability to make decisions and figure out where you need to fit to be successful for your patients, for your organization, and for yourself. The third is culture matters. People talk about strategies and they talk about tactics and they talk about this, that, and the other thing. Culture will crush strategy always. In every organization I've ever been involved in, culture will crush strategy. So when you're making a decision about where to work or who to work with or who to work for, make sure you think about the culture of that organization before you make a decision. And if you're in an organization where you think the culture's just heading in the wrong direction, that should be a little bit of a wake-up call to you. And either try and figure out some way to make it better or find some or try to find some other place to sort of plant your flag in and do what you want to do. Because culture, culture is far more permanent inside most organizations than anything else. Good culture, great stuff happens. People can figure out how to solve problems and bend the rules and do what they need to do to be successful, kind of no matter what. And one of the things I'm proudest of from the time I was at Harvard Pilgrim is most people who work there at every level of the organization will tell you that we created, and it was a we, a can-do, get-it-done, solve-the-problem, don't-care-who-gets-the-credit culture. Um, and, and I think in many ways, especially given all the stuff that's going to be coming down the pike that I've been talking about this morning in healthcare, it's going to be really important to work for places where, that have a healthy culture that gets and understands that it can't be about blame, it's got to be about solutions and problem-solving and team-based approaches that are defined and real to get stuff done. And then finally, um, <laughs> and this is sort of, you know, again, the, the, the guy in the suit. Um, trust your gut, but don't ignore the data. And again, I wish you all the very best of luck, and, and thank you very much for the chance to be here this morning. Charlie's got time for about five minutes of questions, given that this is a healthcare forum. We'd like it if you could like, like structure the question to healthcare. And I think there's a couple of mics up here, so anybody want to ask uh, Charlie Baker a question? And, and Charlie Baker reserves the right to punt the question to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> or he'll answer the question you wanted, he wanted to be asked and not the one you asked. <laughs> Anyone? No, but my goodness. And if you could just introduce yourself, that'd be great. I'm, uh, I'm Isabel Bailey from Boston Children's Hospital uh, Chronic Illness Group. Is there anything that we as social workers can do to help our Medicare patients? Because things are drastically changing for chronic illness um, individuals, both um, uh, children but mostly adults um, who I follow at Children's. Uh, is there anything we can do? Um, or a place where we can go to help with that model of um, intensive care for those who are intensely um, sick? Um, you know, I would love to see, 
Now I am going to make a semi-political statement, and I apologize for doing that. Um, actually, I don't even have to make it about this race. When I ran the last time, I said one of the things I wanted to do was to ask some of the folks in the provider community, especially the folks who dealt with the most complex populations. I mean, I've been following Bob Masters' work forever, okay? And when he was dealing with the HIV community, I thought his approach to it was so much more sensible than a lot of what I saw elsewhere. Um, but one of the things I said the last time I ran was I would like to ask the provider community, especially the folks who deal with really complex populations, if they could build for me a different way to serve those populations. And if they could, I would go as the head of the Commonwealth of Mass, the federal government, and seek a waiver from the feds to try some experiments and different approaches to serving really complex populations. I think this is one where we're kidding ourselves if we think we are going to be able to solve the problems that a lot of these populations have through the traditional means and mechanisms and approaches that we take. And we need to try some different approaches and different models and see what works. And I would love nothing more than to see Massachusetts lead the charge on this. And this is not about big system reform, okay? It, this is about finding people who are dealing with really complicated populations who are discovering that there are cracks and crevices and fragmentation all over the way the system is set up to serve those folks, creating different kinds of models, and then working with the payers, which in my mind are Medicaid and Medicare for most of the folks we're talking about here, to come up with some different ways of serving that population. And I think, you know, the sooner the better, as far as I'm concerned on that. Hi, Joe Levy. Communities for people. Joe uh, Levy. How are you, Joe? I'm good, Joe. How are you? Good. Good. Thank you. Uh, right now, I think we've got some terrific programs in the state, but it seems like, at least for the population I'm dealing with, everybody has to be on mass health. MBHP can then pick them up and others. Uh, am I correct in thinking that under the bra bra brave new world we're going into, that um, the other insurance companies will start giving this kind of coverage, and if so, when? Um, my okay. My understanding is the answer to that is yes, um, but I think that's based on state policy, which I believe is rolling out over the course of this year, and some of it, and I'm not at Harvard Pilgrim anymore, so I'm not as close to this one as I used to be, um, I think that's more an end of the year issue than a beginning of the year issue. But again, I, you know, I haven't been there for five years. I keep telling people that when they call me up and ask me to solve claims problems. And I say, dude, it's been five years. No one cares who I am anymore, you know? It's... Jonas Goldenberg, uh, NASW, Massachusetts chapter. Um, what role do you think government plays or could play in helping social workers to um, negotiate and um, uh, uh, grow into this new future that we have of uh, team-based, uh, PCP-based care, um, electronic health records, et cetera. So what, what is the role of government in You know, one of the things? things I've always thought, and this is, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things I've always thought in healthcare uh, healthcare is more of a show me business than a tell me business. Um, I mean, most of the time when I've been able to get people to think differently about stuff, it's not been by the genius of my idea or my presentation. In fact, that usually falls pretty flat. What generally works is if I can say, see what these guys are doing over here? You know, your peers at whatever? This looks pretty smart. Maybe we should figure out how to do something like that. So I think the opportunity, and I would be supportive of this, would be for folks to put together, and again, I'm starting small, I'm not thinking big. If people put together models that they thought worked, then I would like to be part of the process of catalyzing those models and making them more available through regulatory reform, payer reform, and that type of thing. Because in healthcare, more than most other industries, um, the, the whole idea of replication through, sh uh, through you know, just sort of somebody does this and then everybody, it doesn't work that way. Most of the time in healthcare, you need to be able to show somebody a living, breathing model of something that's working if you want to get them to consider doing that themselves. And I think, I think the state is a, 
as a payer and as a regulator can play a big role in this. And I think the missing part in this is everybody wants to do this, you know, across the system. And I think a big part of the solution around some of this, especially with the, the more complex populations, it's actually small little coalitions of the willing that are far more likely to move the, to move the needle in terms of coming up with more effective and, and more clinically effective and more cost effective ways of serving those populations. And, and I think the state's role on that should be to be a little less, um, what's the word I want? Um, a little less rule driven and a little more interested in what I would call some creative noncompliance. Thank you very much.